Fantastic. So thank you everyone for attending. Um, I will be saving some time for questions and answers later on. Uh, of course, if during the presentation you want me to slow down, stop, go over a topic, uh, that's cool too. Denise will reach out and grab me and, and let me know that there's a question out there. Uh, the slides will be available on SlideShare a little bit later on, and obviously, of course, we're recording this. So let's jump right in very, very quickly with basically uh, the Apache way and inner source. Uh, and this will be sort of like an introduction to both topics but also how the two align, how the two uh, complement each other, and how in many ways uh, some of the main topics of inner source kind of follow along what the main guiding principles are of the Apache way. Uh, a little bit about me, um, just so you know that I hopefully know what I'm talking about. Uh, I did, along with a number of other people, co-found the Apache Software Foundation. Um, and have been a, a member since then and have worn numerous hats during my uh, multi-decade tenure there. Uh, basically, every director and every executive officer hat other than treasurer. I still consider myself a developer at heart. And you'll realize that as we start talking about some of these principles, uh, at least my interpretation of them still focus on the alignment and the attraction to the individual unaligned, unaffiliated developer, the contributor. Uh, and we'll see how that fits into um, inner source, since in a lot of ways, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to pull in people who basically their day jobs, you know, aren't necessarily on the project that you're working with, but you're hoping to grow that community. You're trying to, uh, to grow that uh, as well. So what is inner source? And there are a lot of definitions um, uh, about what inner source is. Uh, I think one of the main things that we want to remember is that, is that there is no space between those two words. It is inner source all squished together like that. So if you are one of those people who do it with two words, stop doing that. Uh, in many ways, inner source is the idea of taking the lessons learned of successful open source projects and bringing those in-house, using them internally as part of your enterprise IT development processes, uh, making um, you know, that idea, that methodology, part of how you normally do business when you're doing software development. Uh, another way of looking at it is basically uh, running your internal development as if it was an open source project, uh, as much as possible. I mean, obviously, of course, uh, some of the conditions, some of the guidelines, some of the restrictions, and some of the expectations will be different. We'll be touching on, on most of those as we go through. But the main idea is that you want to create an environment which tries to draw in people who normally wouldn't be affiliated with your project internally to encourage that sort of external usage and contributions. And I'll be talking not only about the techniques, the, the how of doing it, but I think it's also vitally important to understand the why. Because if you understand the why, if you understand the reasoning behind some of these guidings, some of these uh, you know, processes and procedures, you can fine tune the techniques, the how, to fit your own individual uh, circumstance and situation which is vital and critical for really good open source success inside of your, uh, inside of your corporation. Uh, why inner source? Why is, is, is inner source something which is being, um, you know, discussed and, you know, why are we all here, uh, you know, excited about it and talking about it? And some of this may have already been, uh, been discussed, but then again, this is my, my take on it. Um, one of the biggest things for me as someone who, you know, leads an open source program office is that it really is a strategic advantage for a company, not only to use and leverage open source, but to also run your internal projects in a very, very similar way as you're cooperating with the open source communities out there. It avoids that context switch, that conflict between how you do things internally and how you do things externally. And I think that's a very, very important thing to factor in the more you're dependent upon using and consuming external open source communities. Uh, another big advantage is that you're gaining the efficiency by leveraging the talent as much as possible. Uh, we see, for example, 
that really good developers, really good architects and coders and programmers are artists by nature. They want to share their craft. Uh, open source has provided an opportunity for, do that, for them to do that outside of their work environment. Intersource provides them an opportunity to do that inside their work environment. Intersource is also a great way of, uh, you know, ensuring uh, code reuse and sharing and collaboration among teams to break down those silos and really get the best efficiencies in, all, in your engineering workforce out there. Uh, the big advantage of that is two things. First of all, it allows you to be much more innovative inside of uh, your development structure, but it also allows you to bring products to, to market bear faster, faster than in your competition, and you know to make things better for not only your employees, but also your customers and your shareholders as well. Uh, the Apache way, um, and I will admit, I don't think there is one canonical, everyone agrees definition of what the Apache way is. When you start talking about the details, uh, some of the common ideas, some of the common memes are, of course, generally well accepted. Those are the ones I'll be talking about. But there might be uh, different interpretations, different flavors of the Apache way inside here. But it basically boils down to how the ASF and the projects under the ASF umbrella work and operate. It's, it's the governance model that we expect these projects to, to abide by. Um, the basic governance principles that says, this is how a project grows. This is how you encourage uh, you know, external contributors. These are the ways of doing development and testing development. The ideas behind this is that you're trying to attract contributors. You're trying to attract not only users, but also developers and other people as well. And if you're not doing that in a way which is open and transparent to people, if the, the rules of the game aren't very, very well known, or even worse, very, very complex, chances are good that they're just going to skip by. And so these are some of the lessons that we learned, you know, for over the last 20 years or so, on how we think is the best way to, to govern open source projects out there. And basically all the open source projects, which under the ASF um, need to, to abide by these. You know, so why focus on the ASF? Well, I, I think in general, the ASF is very, very well um, acknowledged as being very, very good in the open source community. It's got a very great um, reputation with the open source community, but also with the corporate environments as well. And because Apache is about open source and corporations working together, then of course the principles of open source um, as defined by the Apache way align very well with the principles of inner source as well. Some of the ideas behind Apache that we just talked about very, very quickly is that, you know, it is a nonprofit foundation. So it really is a very neutral place for people to collaborate, people being individuals as well as corporations out there. We've had a number of successes, but we've also had a number of failures. And those failures are in some ways even more illuminating than the successes because it's the failures that show us either where we weren't abiding by our own rules or where the rules no longer did apply. Now I'll give you a very, very short history you know, of the Apache way. And it basically goes back to the beginnings of the Apache web server. The idea being that there was this large user community of the old NCSA web server that was basically being developed by one person, Rob McCool. Now, of course, when Netscape started up and Rob joined there, he had this software project that was incredibly useful, that a lot of people were dependent upon it. There was a huge and thriving user community. There really wasn't a contributor community. There wasn't a developer community out there. Luckily, we were able to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and create the, uh, the Apache group, which later on became uh, the Apache Software Foundation. But the main takeaway behind this is that it realized the importance of community, not only a user community, but a developer community. And that was the only way to ensure the long-term survival and viability and health of an open source project is by focusing on that community, focusing on the aspects of the community. And especially if you could fine tune that towards the 
unaligned, unaffiliated, you know, volunteer contributor, someone who was just doing it because they had an interest in the project, that was even better. You know, so if we could focus on that, that would be, you know, the, the icing on the cake. So one of the reasons why we say a lot that Apache is all about community equals code is because of that. It's because of that awareness that healthy, viable communities create healthy and viable projects. And if there are poisonous people or things that are detrimental to the survival of a community, then it's gonna be detrimental to the long-term survival of the project itself. And as I go through the topics, the, the main ideas of the Apache Way, I'll specifically mention and pick out how those things are, are uh, important. So the main core tenets, I think, of the Apache Way are these three main points. The idea uh, of meritocracy, and understand that uh, in many ways, uh, the term meritocracy is, is kind of verboten. Um, there's been discussions on what we want to do as far as rename it. If you want to think about it as a duocracy, that's as well. Transparency is another core tenant, and community is another core tenant. And I'll talk about those in more detail as we talk about the basic memes that support those tenants. So we have six basic memes that support these three core tenants. Uh, the first is the idea of meritocracy, uh, which by definition just means governed by merit. Uh, the more you do, the more you're able to do. Uh, that you are measured by your contributions, by what you provide to the project, by the contributions and the talents and the skills and the resources that you bring to bear, not who you are, not who your employer is, not who you're, um, who you're friends with or things of that way. The reasoning behind that is, again, if you start thinking about you want to attract unaligned um, uh, you know, volunteers, if you needed to be in the clique already to be part of the clique, then you were disenfranchising large people. So the idea is that merit was based on what you could provide at the level you were able to provide it. Another thing that was important in the idea behind it is that merit never expires. Again, if you're a volunteer, life happens. You know, you might be away for six months or so due to, you know, a, a life changing moment a marriage, a death in the family, or something like that. If you had to start from scratch when you came back, that wouldn't be very, very good. So merit never expires. You're always there because you have provided some value uh, later on before. One of the main things about the idea of meritocracy is that it provides the incentive to do more. Uh, it, it's not tacky in the way that I think gamification is, but meritocracy is more about direct value and benefit as it relates to the project. Um, and inside the ASF, there are a very, very few levels um, of hierarchy based on meritocracy. And it's flat for a specific reason. Uh, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit. Another idea behind the concept of, of meritocracy and the Apache way in general is that it's very, very peer-based. That, uh, again, you're based on uh, what you do. There is an expectation, uh, a level of, of trust and the respect associated among in there. But the biggest thing to worry about, or the biggest thing to take away from it, is that unlike other governance models, you know, Linux, for example, um, where there is a governance model called the uh, benevolent dictator for life, there is no single person or or a small group of, uh, of people who are the uh, people who drive consensus. You know, they aren't the stopgap, the fail safe system for if the community can't figure out what to do, oh, they'll figure it out. You know, um, those people would decide for us. By not having that safety valve when you're driving consensus, um, it forces consensus. It allows everyone to have a vote and a say in it. And that only is possible if all the votes hold the same weight. So even if someone's been in a project for 20 years or 20 seconds, their weight, their vote, the, you know, the, the way their vision is towards a project counts the exact same. Now, you'll notice that as we start talking about some of these, some of these map very, very well in the concept of inner source. And some of these really don't map very well in the, in the topic of inner source. And we'll talk about those, those things later on. 
The biggest thing about p being peer-based is that you feel part of a community. You are an active value member inside the community. And so by doing that, the idea of consensus is very important. And inside the ASF, we've got this voting model, which is really used uh, quite a lot in a lot of other places. The plus one, minus one, you know, zero. And it really is a voting system per se. It's not like a democratic vote, but really it's a way to measure engaged consensus inside there. As with most open source projects, the focus on collaborative development is important and vital. And that's only possible if the development environment that you're in is transparent and in public. Um, if key decisions are being made behind closed doors, then that will, again, disenfranchise people who are looking at the project and wanting to do that. And so a lot of the development for ASF projects are still done on mailing lists, as old school as that may be, for the simple reason that it's asynchronous, easily archivable, but it also doesn't uh, disenfranchise people who are you know, in a different time zone or things of that nature. So it's a nice way of encouraging collaborative development by using an older technology that was based around the idea of people being active or being able to be active in very, very different time frames. Now, all of this, of course, would be not if there wasn't a mechanism for responsible oversight. And another part of the Apache way is making sure that you're tracking the IP, you're making sure the quality is, is assured, and you're dependent upon the community, not only the actual contributor community, but also the user community as well to provide that insight. So in a lot of ways, it kind of uh, was a premonition to the agile technology where you're bringing in you know, the, the, the customer, the user as a prime driver in the development process. Now, with that idea behind the principles of, of uh, the Apache way, I think there are six main principles behind inner source. Um, culture, community, transparency, collaboration, uh, uh, community, and then meritocracy. I might have said that community twice. But anyway, uh, I'll go into more details uh, about these. And again, I'm going to focus on the principles as well as some of the ideas behind it. One of the things I think that most people don't realize, when you are implementing inner source inside of your company, it could be a major seismic cultural event. The idea of sharing the information, the idea of breaking down the silos, the idea of various development teams working together on multiple projects instead of focusing on like tunnel vision on one particular project um, is sort of like an anathema to a, a lot of companies, a lot of company culture inside there. Um, and the idea that it is a cultural shift cannot be diminished. Um, and this is most probably some of the hardest work up front is making sure that your company is ready for that cultural shift and making sure that you have the resources inside your company to make that happen. Um, you want to create this, uh, this expected set of behaviors. You want to make sure that the governance model that you're trying to implement is very, very well known. Um, you need to have some major buy-in at the major players inside your company to make this sort of cultural event achievable. So some of the things to do is, is, first of all, be the model and the guide. Depending on where you are in your open source journey, that may be easy. If you're a company that uses and leverages a lot of open source, then bringing those, those open source models into your company it will be much, much easier. Um, if you're not, then try to think of a project inside your company which is using or leveraging open source. Uh, some low hanging fruit that you can possibly focus some resources on. Do what you can to encourage them, to have them start working and acting that way uh, in their own development cycle. That will provide the assurance to managers and higher ups that this technique works, but they will also be the advocates that you can grow, grow and rely on as well. That it won't just be your job anymore. You'll have some definite proof that this way, this culture, this understanding of how to do software development actually has returns on that investment. And by improving the culture, by having the culture defined for you, that would necessarily drive the next step, which is communication. 
another big thing that in the same way the culture can in some instances be an issue depending on where, where your company is. Again, a lot of companies are very, very siloed. The idea of open communication um, is, is very, very different uh, and very, very difficult to implement. But for InterSource to succeed, it really is core and fun, uh, foundational. Everything else really does um, rely on that. And the more restrictive your communication is, uh, the more synchronous it is, the more focused and, 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 and siloed it is, the more difficulty you will be having in pulling in from your you know, existing engineer set other contributions, other people who want to use the software, other people who are ready to depend and rely on a project that really your team is, 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 is focusing on. And that's for really what you're trying to do, is you're trying to reduce the risk of other teams using your software by having them part stakeholders inside that software and allowing them the opportunity to keep things going. You know, we've all been there where, you know, priorities changed inside of companies and a project which last month was last month's hotness has now gone away. You know, if you were an internal company or if you were an internal manager, you remember that. And so sometimes the whole idea of we'll do it ourselves is a lot safer because of the risk associated with it. By having this open communication, by really driving inner source, it allows you to avoid that. It reduces that risk inside there. So as much as you can, if you're really gonna embrace inner source, look at various ways of expanding your communication mechanisms um, beyond um, maybe what you have been currently doing. And obviously most people are working remote now. So the idea is that you have to be in an office. Uh, for innovation to happen, for development to happen is, is kind of passe. But there is still a real attraction for Zoom meetings, uh, for Slack interactions, which implies some level of, you know, time zone uh, adherence. It's, it's semi-synchronous. If someone is in a different time zone than the vast majority of the team, then they will necessarily feel left out because all the good conversations were going on back when, when things were going. So in addition to using Zoom and Slack and, and you know, WebEx and everything else, for those times when you need synchronous communication, try to focus a lot more on asynchronous communications. Move stuff into groups, uh, into mailing lists as much as possible. The nice thing about this is that this naturally archives the tribal knowledge that a team has. Uh, and that's something that, again, for the continuance of a project, you need to maintain that tribal knowledge. It needs to transcend the individual people who are there at that particular time it needs to be an asset that people can just come in, maybe read over an archive or something like that, and have some understanding of how things grow. Jim, um, we have a question on this slide. Oleg wants, Oleg wants to know, how efficient is the model of decision-making via the mail list? Getting consensus on a mail list probably takes months. Um, actually, it, it, it doesn't, um, you know, because most of the discussions are, are being done asynchronously, you know? So it's not as if you have this, this really weird concept or this, you know, uh, implementation or feature that you want added in and you bring it up out of the blue, you know? You just drop it on the people's lap and stuff like that. Uh, you, you talk about it, you engage with it. You, you know, you, you use the same sort of methodologies that you would necessarily use on open source projects by encouraging people to get involved with it. The actual decision-making process can be um, uh, can be extremely quick, as long as you also make it small bites. You know, don't have the decision making process and all or one thing for something which is all encompassing. Try to make it into bite sized portions that are easy to get uh, agreement and situations through. You know, certainly yes, um, it is possible that in some situations, looking for consensus or trying to drive consensus. Uh, will be um, a, a, a will have will result in a delay that wouldn't be there if you had one single person saying no. This is what we're going to do, and sometimes that's okay. I'm not saying that the benevolent dictator for life model is incorrect. It's a perfectly viable model, and certainly in some projects inside your open your inner source journey, having someone be that ultimate authority 
makes sense. You know, having someone to do that. That's especially good at the very beginnings of your journey because it allows them to groom and guide the decision making process such that they can start stepping away from being the, the, the blocker or the gate holder, as it were. So again, use these techniques as, as required. It isn't an all or nothing scenario. Jim, are you going to talk about lazy consensus somewhere in the stack? Uh, I will be, yes. Okay, great. Sure. Um, so once you have the ideas that, hey, we want to have, you know, encourage as much as possible the idea of, 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 of open communication, it drives the model of, of transparency. Um, uh, one of the, uh, the the best analogies I uh, I, I talked I, I was uh, made aware of is the idea that having something public is like um, allowing people to look through the window inside of a kitchen in a restaurant. You can kind of like see what they're doing. Full transparency is allowing you to walk inside the kitchen, that you're able to see everything you want to do. And when you're talking about being um, fully engaged in a, in a project, fully engaged in a software development scheme. That level of transparency is, is very, very important because it encourages this open public mindset inside there. The other thing about transparency is that you need this sort of deep, unadulterated view to be able to measure success or measure failure or find out the metrics which are working or find out the things that aren't working. And you can only reuse things that you won't know about. So making things as much uh, as transparent as possible, not only in the process, but also what's available, what has worked and what hasn't worked, really allows you to continue driving things in a way that encourages external communication out there. And without the transparency, you can't get the sort of detailed data as far as what is our return on investment? You know, how, how can we gauge this? How can we incentivize employees to, uh, to engage in this inner source journey? You can't get the data required by that without some level of transparency, without knowing what's going on inside these projects. And the transparency also is what helps drive the idea of collaboration. Collaboration is what this really is all driving towards. Collaboration is about the idea of getting as many people engaged as possible. That's only possible if they have a common vision, a common goal, a common set of criteria, a common experience that they can share. So all the other things that we're doing up until this time is in preparation for collaboration. If you provide the tools at the very, very beginning, but you don't provide the cultural change, the drive and the need for open communication, then your inner source journey is going to be at least 10 times more difficult because the tools don't make it succeed. It's the cultural aspect. The tools are the method to get to that point. Collaboration is the goal that we're looking at. The code reuse and having external people and internal people use your code drives that. And so again, we're talking about uh, a consensus building. Uh, we want to drive that consensus. We want to get that, uh, that as much as possible. Um, and one of the ways of doing that, in addition to the idea of voting, you know, hey, you know, this is what we want to do. How does it look? Um, Apache has this idea called lazy consensus, which is, hey, I'm thinking about doing this or making this change or making this feature or implementing this functionality inside there. Um, and you go through the details associated with it. You don't just, you know, it's not this nebulous, vague thing. You actually have the code and stuff like that um, and say, I'm going to go and apply this or I'm going to implement this with all the information back in there. Um, you know, and I'll just assume that unless I hear otherwise after three days or seven days, whatever works in your environment, three days is the norm inside of Apache, that everybody's cool with it. You know, that's called lazy consensus. I will assume consensus after a certain period of time, unless someone comes back and says, oh, hold on for a second, there's an issue with it. Now, that doesn't mean that once lazy consensus is, a, is approved, that it's then golden, that it's cut in concrete and can't be changed. You can always, after the fact, change it. But it, again, a, 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 has this way 
of fast tracking ideas without requiring this full gauged assessment uh, of consensus at the very, very beginning. And we use that quite a lot in environments where in addition to having something stable and reliable and robust, we want to also have a branch for, you know, move fast and break things hard inside there. To really encourage collaboration, you need to make sure that all the build and test tools require it to see if your patch works, if it doesn't cause regressions uh, as they, you know, as people want to contribute or provide contributions and, and pull requests to your project. Um, they need to have access to the almost the same build in, in test suite that you have. Otherwise, hey, here's a patch. I'm giving it to you. Somebody else has to go and run it and provide it. That's a long delay. Then they have to provide feedback, allow the user to do that themselves. They feel part and parcel of it. And then again, it encourages people to do what they can because they don't, they're not, they don't have to offload it to anybody. They don't need to worry about it. And also another great thing is have newbie issues. You know, if you're going to inner source something, don't make sure that all the low hanging fruit is, is resolved and save only the big, heavy, nasty stuff for external contrib contributors. That requires a lot of upfront work for people. Instead, you know, leave some low hanging fruit for people to jump in very, very quickly. And then finally, that sort of ideas bring into existence of community. A community is what things go on. A community is what we're driving for because that's helps make create this long-term viability uh, of the project itself. And then we talk about back to the whole idea of meritocracy and by having this, this community around it of shared people with a shared mindset, you're driving the idea that there are peers, but also technical esper, experts that can, you can grow and rely on. And that's something that again, can be shared throughout the entire uh, company itself. And finally, you get this full circle where the meritocracy, the people who are engaged, the people who are embracing the inner source movement help drive the culture inside there. So I have a couple of final thoughts. Um, I guess one of the nice things to remember is that the community is not the same as a team. A team is something which is imposed, whereas a community is self-organizing, self-identifying. And the open source experience has shown that left to their own devices, a community, the, a self-organized group of people can do and will do fantastic work with tight schedules because it's a passion for them. It, 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 it tickles their idea of honing their skills and their talent. Um, there is some upfront work associated with it. As with, as with most things, um, you know, inner source is not a, a free ride. So make sure you fully understand what you're getting into before you implement, otherwise you're going to fail. Uh, so it requires work, it requires investment, and it, uh, it requires uh, acceptance and awareness from people who are your stakeholders. You're going to need air cover in a lot of cases to make this work. Make sure you have that air cover uh, uh, available inside there. I guess one of the main takeaways um, is I love this quote uh, from, um, from the author of The, uh, the Little Prince. Um, and it's not an exact quote, but this is the most famous one out there. Um, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up the uh, men to gather wood, divide the work, and give orders. The normal traditional way we think of software development. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. Uh, open source has shown us that, as I said before, people want to contribute. People want to work on something as a community, as a group, and make it better. Inner source is about enabling that idea, that culture, that environment inside your enterprise IT structure in a way that you're able to gain those benefits of fast driving information, uh, employee and contributor happiness, and just fantastic results for the company and the shareholders. Thank you.